shines more bright and clear when tempests rage without that when in danger knows no fear in darkness feels no doubt Lord give us such a faith as this and in what Invitation, we'll sing a couple of stanzas from number three. You make me sick. Those are words that if someone uttered them to us, we would feel the weight of them. If we uttered them to someone, we would, in many cases, almost every case that I can think of, rightly so, be corrected by the people who are around us for using that type of a language. If our children used it, we certainly would not be, find that to be acceptable. Because the words, you make me sick, or when I see you, you make me want to throw up, are strong words. But don't ever forget this. Those are the words that Jesus spoke to his own church. When he looked at them, he said, you make me sick. In Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness and beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Some translations will say vomit, which is probably a better idea of what's going on here. For you say I am rich and I have prospered and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched and pitiable, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I, re I reprove and discipline so be zealous and repent. Behold I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's the seventh and final letter that Jesus has addressed, and he has addressed it to the Laodiceans. Now, as we think about this particular church, as we follow the same basic structure and model as Jesus did as he addressed each of these churches, we first begin with this city. And what, again, is so fascinating, which we, didn't have, we don't, haven't had the time to go in and look at every way, but it's so interesting to see that churches take on the personality of their cultures if they're not careful. You had exceptions. You had Smyrna. You had Philadelphia. They didn't take on the personalities of their particular cultures, but on the whole, the church was taking on the personality of their culture. And one of the things, the, the big problem with that is this. God put us in the world to be salt and light to alter the culture. 
not to welcome it in with open arms. And so what we're seeing with these churches is something that can happen with so many. Now, first of all, when we think about this city and its geography, it's located, it's the last stop on this postal route, and we'll see that. It kind of makes this circle, Ephesus, and then it goes up and it circles down, and we're now at the very end of this postal route. It's built on a 100-foot plateau, and there are three cities in what is known as this Lycus River Valley. So you have Laodicea, then you have a city named Areopolis, six miles to the north, and then you have Colossae, 10 miles to the east, and these three areas come together in this Lycus River Valley. Now the issue that, and we're going to see this come up, the issue with the city itself, it was an extremely prosperous city, but they had a fundamental issue, and that was water. If you're building a civilization, you're building a city, you need a water source. Their water source was corrupted, okay? And we'll talk more about that, and Jesus will actually play on that here in a little bit. It was actually considered, when they look at even the modern-day water sources from that area, it was rich in calcium carbonate and other impurities. And some individuals actually, when they drank it, especially visitors to the city who had never been, when they drank the water supply, they would immediately throw up. It was that disturbing and dissettling to the stomach. Now, this city was founded a little more than almost three centuries before Christ. It was founded by Antiochus II, and he named it in the honor of his wife, Laodice, whom he later divorced in 253 B.C. It began as a fortress city. Now, again, that's a problem. When Jerusalem was besieged, Hezekiah built a conduit to bring water into the city, which has since been discovered. It's how we have been able to verify that a cubit was 18 inches because there were writings on the wall of that conduit that said it's this many cubits. And so when we measured it, it came out and showed us that a cubit was actually 18 inches, especially by Jewish standards. But anyway, I say that to say there was a water source. Even when he was going to be besieged, he found a way to get water into his city. It's vital. Now, as a fortress city, Laodicea struggled because they did not have a water source that was good and that could solve their issues. However, when Rome took over, you might have heard the term Pax Romana. That that talks about the peace that Rome brought because they controlled so much. As a matter of fact, the, the Romans called the Mediterranean Sea, when you look at a map and you see everything surrounding it, the Romans called the Mediterranean Sea our sea because they owned and controlled everything around it. Now, because they brought peace and you did not have war going on between small cities, that freed the city up to kind of innovate and connect in commerce. And in that commerce, they were able then to remedy some of their water problems. The Roman historian Tacitus tells us there was a large Jewish population based upon an event with gold. It's an important trade center, and there are three particular things you want to see about this particular city, and Jesus will actually use all three of them in his address. Number one, they were known for soft black wool. Soft black wool. They would use it to make uh, garments that were highly expensive and uh, rugs and things along that line. Number two, it was a banking center, an abundance of gold. As a matter of fact, Tacitus tells us about the large Jewish population because their attempt to smuggle gold out of the city. Then you had a great medical school that was in, located here. Actually, it started out outside of Laodicea, a few miles out, and then it was later moved in to Laodicea, and they were known for ear and eye salve. It was called Phrygian powder. Phrygian, Phrygia is the region where it's located, and so it was a powder that they developed, a concoction they developed to help the individuals with their eyesight. Obviously, it's not going to be anything comparable to our modern-day capabilities with medicine, but it was revolutionary for its time. They were so wealthy. You remember that we've studied a number of these cities were destroyed by earthquakes and the Roman Empire helped them, right? They alleviated the tax burden for 10 years and they also sent extra money. Laodicea was so wealthy that when Rome offered money, they said no. They simply footed the bill themselves. They were that wealthy they could afford it. And so you have an extremely wealthy city. Now when you look at the religion in the city... There was a temple to the god Men, M-E-N, and the medical school was associated with his particular temple. It was also a center for imperial worship, that is, worship to the Roman Empire. And so it's a, a very wealthy city. And one of the things you learn, and it's not... The Bible is in no way against wealth, okay? It's in no way against wealth. 
But it does show for us that in wealth, you have, can have a major stumbling block to your faith. You could also have stumbling blocks to poverty, but in wealth, it also shows us that. And anytime you've ever been involved in mission works, when you go into more affluent communities, the openness to talk with anybody is very low, okay? But as a matter of fact, one mission trip we were on when I was in preaching school, uh, in preaching school you have campaigns, three out of your four quarters, you go and there's a meeting held and you knock doors and things along that line. One of the campaigns we did in the outskirts of Atlanta and they were sending us into all these subdivisions that were well, that were affluent. Now, you run into a number of issues. Number one, beside the issue that many times they're not welcoming, to have properties like this, where are you in the middle of the day when we're knocking doors? You're at work, okay? So we would go and we would walk through and we'd be in all these affluent neighborhoods, couldn't get anywhere, and yet we were driving by poorer neighborhoods where we saw people sitting on the front porch and we went and asked the people if we could stop going here and start going here. I won't tell you what the answer because it was somewhat disappointing. But the point being, your wealth can sometimes, you feel insulated. There's not really much that can happen to you that you can't take care of, in your mind anyway, about money. And that mentality is what's going to creep into Laodicea. There's this sense of accomplishment and uh, no need to strive further. Now, this congregation is a little bit different than some of the others. We do not know exactly when this particular congregation was established. What we do know, or seem to know from Colossians chapter 2 and verse 1, is that it was not established by the Apostle Paul. Because in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 1, Paul writes to this church in Colossae, which is in the same region. You remember, you've got Areopolis, and then you've got Laodicea and Colossae. So when he writes to Colossae, he says, I have great stirrings for those in Laodicea and all others who have not seen me face to face. So the implication seems to be that they did not know him. Okay? And so when you look at Colossians 1 and verse 7, there's a man named there that is believed to be the son of Philemon, mentioned in Philemon 2. Or actually, he's mentioned in Colossians 4, 17. There's another man mentioned in in Colossians 1 and verse 7, and those were main ministers. And so it's believed that maybe one of those two men actually started the congregation in Laodicea. And so uh, from their base in Colossae. So this is a congregation that we have a little bit more information about than some others. We also know from Colossians chapter 4 and verse 16 that it seems as if Paul has written them a letter as well. It may be that they received the letter from, some, from another apostle, but it seems as if Paul wrote it. Because when Paul is concluding the, the Colossian letter, he says, When this letter is read amongst you, make sure that it is read also in the church at Laodicea and that you also get the letter from Laodicea and read it in your assembly. Okay? And so it's a congregation that was not started by Paul, but Paul does seem to have some kind of a relationship with it. Obviously, this, by the time this is written, Paul has been dead for at least two decades, pushing three decades. So that's the congregation at Colossae. Now, <clears throat> let's look at the way Christ presents himself. And I think I've gone... Nope, I haven't. All right. I jammed my... Uh, So you see Areopolis there, there to the north, Colossae to the southeast, and there's Laodicea. This is the Syrian road. This is on the way to, uh, man, I always get these confused. This road is either to Colossae or Areopolis. I cannot recall which road this is, but it's to, you're going in two different directions. It's a Syrian gate. You're going in two different directions. Um, <clears throat> but this is one of the roads that's still preserved. All right, this is one of your theaters. There were quite a few in, in, in different views. You see how it's built into uh, a plateau. It's built into a mountain region. <clears throat> okay, now here are clay pipes that they would bring water into the city in, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. All right, here you see some more clay pipes that are still present by which water would have been brought into the city. This is another view you can see, and there's a city up here to the, nor- to the left side of the screen, and we'll point that out here in just a little bit. This is no- but you can kind of see the beauty and the breathtaking view that was uh, a part of their everyday life. This is one of their temples in the city that's still there. This is actually a bath house, okay? 
if you'll notice, when you watch the stone here on the bottom, well, not on the bottom, but on the upper left side, in the stone there is a divot like a U. That's where a clay jar or a clay pipe would have run in and water would have flowed through that pipe and down onto the ground and so you'd fill up and you would have a pool uh, or a bathhouse for people. <clears throat> this is another, uh, this, this is covering and you see the water. You see the way it's cut here for water to run through and drain in systems. This is actually a picture of Areopolis because in Areopolis you had hot springs of water. Okay, many people would go there for medicinal reasons to help breathing and things along that line. And so that's a modern day picture. You still have the hot springs. <clears throat> now, this is again one of the theaters, but you see the arrow and you see that place in the distance. That's Areopolis. So you're in Laodicea and you can see Areopolis on the other side of the valley in the mountain. <clears throat> this is actually at the foot of the mountain of a spring that flows into Colossae. So Laod or excuse me, Areopolis had a hot spring for medicinal purposes that was used. Colossae had a cold spring of water that was used for refreshment. And so that is actually going to come into play here. Jesus is going to use that geographical play when he discusses what's going on with, these, uh, with the Laodicean church. All right? <clears throat> so those are some things about that particular city. Now, let's watch the way Christ introduced himself. First of all, he introduces himself as one who fulfills the words of the amen. The word amen simply means, so be it. For an example, <clears throat> we're studying John on Wednesday nights. We talked about in the introduction, and we've seen it in other places, these truly, truly, or verily, verily. The word is amen. The Greek term is. It's a double emphasis. And the reason why you would say amen, we're accustomed to saying amen at the end of a prayer, right? Jesus is saying amen at the beginning of a statement to say what I'm about to tell you is certain and true. So he introduces it with a double amen. Whereas sometimes we will close our prayers or close statements and sometimes people will affirm an amen based upon a truthful statement to show the truthfulness of the statement. The amen is the emphasis to the truthfulness of the statement. You'll see it throughout scripture. And so Jesus is here being presented as the amen. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20, Paul describes Jesus as the amen of God. He is the one, all the promises of God find their fulfillment in him. Everything about the Old Testament, all of the promises that God had made, they're all packaged and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus says, I'm the amen, he's saying, I'm the fulfillment. I, valid, I, am the, I validate the promises of God and I bring them to fruition. Then he calls them the faithful, calls himself the faithful and the true witness this is taken from chapter 1 and verse 5 in the introduction of the book. It's, it's talking about his prophetic office, okay? That he is a prophet, that what he speaks is true, it comes to pass. And that's going to be very important as he's speaking to Laodicea, who is a church who is, they're very comfortable. And the idea that somebody could tell them they're not right when they think they're right, they're going to need to understand the authority of the one speaking. And that's why Jesus will introduce himself that way. <clears throat> Then he describes himself as the beginning of the creation of God, or some, in, some translations will say the firstborn, excuse me, of the creation or God's creation. Now, when we're talking about beginning or firstborn, <clears throat> this is not the way certain religious groups corrupt this to say that Jesus was created and then created everything else. That's, uh, well, number one, it's heresy. It's just, it's a flat out misrepresentation of who Jesus is. It's an attack upon his character. It's an attack upon his being. But firstborn or beginning, the, I think firstborn is probably the better idea. Firstborn, when we hear that term firstborn, we think of chronology. You have your firstborn child, your secondborn child, thirdborn child. Think of it more in the Jewish way of understanding. The firstborn didn't just imply chronology. What did it also imply? It implied all of the blessings all of the estate that went to the firstborn son. For an example, it's used in Psalm 89 and verse 27 to describe the blessings that would flow to David, the firstborn. So <clears throat> what he's saying is the firstborn of the beginning of God's creation is that it all springs from him. And we see this from major passages that talk about Jesus in John 1, in Hebrews 1, in Colossians 1, that he's the one who actually created the world as we know it. And so he presents himself as the authoritative individual, the fulfillment of all of God's promises, who is faithful, and he is first 
and he should be honored as first. And what is interesting <clears throat> is that sometimes it's people who refuse to honor him. My usual Sunday morning routine is to wake up and to grab my Bible and my notes and to go out under our pavilion in the backyard and sit in one of our rocking chairs and to study for that morning. And a lot of mornings, especially in the spring and summer months, <clears throat> you go out there, you sit down, and you listen to the noise, which usually at, at that time is not too noisy. But you hear birds, you hear wind blowing, you hear all these different things. And the thought comes over me many times, the whole creation is doing what God created it to do, except for human beings. We're the only ones that are foolish enough not to do what he's created us to do. And sometimes our prayer has to be in those moments, help me to be faithful the way that the rest of your creation is. Help me to make the right choice to do the right thing because it all belongs to him, including me, and I need to live that way. Now let's move to the condemnation that he gives them. It's very simple. He tells them they're sickening to him. Now notice something. This is very interesting. We've talked about this when we introduced this. You've got seven churches. Two of them, Jesus only praises them. Two of them, Jesus condemns them summarily. Three of them, he has good things and bad things. But even when you take those subcategory of churches that are condemned, Sardis and Laodicea, in Sardis, in chapter 3 and verse 4, you remember what he said about them? This was a church that was in trouble, but he said, you've even got a few names in Sardis who haven't defiled their garment. So even in the midst of all this condemnation, and we would describe that as a condemning letter because the whole of it is, the whole of the church stands condemned, there's still a small element that can be praised. In Laodicea, there is nothing. There is not even a pocket or a small group of people he can praise. Nothing good is said of Laodicea. And so he says, I wish that you were hot or cold. Now sometimes this text is read, and again we're playing hot and cold, so you go back to the water systems, like Areopolis, hot, or like Colossae, cold. And what's interesting is they're, they're right in the middle on the map. Here, <laughs> here is Laodicea, here is Colossae, here is Areopolis. They're right in the middle. And their geography actually indicates their spirituality. You have hot to the north, cold to the south, and you're dead in the middle, lukewarm. And he says, I wish you were one or the other. Now, sometimes this text is interpreted to say, Jesus is saying, I wish you would either be, before, for, be all for me hot or all against me cold. I personally don't think that's what he's saying. I think what he's saying is this, I wish you could be useful because as we said, the hot springs to the north were useful. They had medicinal purposes. The cold springs to the south were useful because they helped refresh the soul. And so what he's saying is, I wish that you were useful, either hot or cold, but I can't use you like this. Think about it even today. There are drinks that we like that are cold and there are drinks that we like that are hot. But both of those drinks, no matter how we like them, whether cold or hot, if they're lukewarm, we don't really want them. Cold and hot both can be useful. And so what he's saying to them here is, I wish you were useful to me. But because you're not, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Old Testament language in Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20 to describe the land vomiting the people of Israel out into captivity. And it reminds you of Old Testament statements when God would say to his people in Isaiah chapter 1, <clears throat> I hate your feasts. Or in Amos chapter 5, I despise your feasts. Or in Malachi chapter 1, I wish somebody would just shut the doors to the temple. Because what you bring me is sickening. And he asked them in that context, should I really accept this from you? And their argument was, well, we're, we're coming to you in worship. We're bringing stuff to you. And, Jesus, and God says to them, but look at it. What you're bringing me is an embarrassment. I wish you would just shut the doors instead. 
One writer put it this way when summing up Laodicea and Jesus and his assessment of the other churches. He was disappointed with the Ephesian church that they had abandoned their first love. His anger burned against the churches that had compromised with the world and invited corruption into their midst. But the lukewarm Laodicean church was disgusting. And here's the worst part. In verse 17, you have this back and forth. What I would call the first part of the verse, Jesus, from the perspective of Jesus, Jesus is saying, this is what you say. And the second part of the verse, this is what I say. So you say versus I say. Listen to what they say. For you say, I'm rich, I have prospered, I need nothing. They're good. They consider themselves to be faithful. They consider themselves to be right in the sight of God. And Jesus said, that's what you say, but I say, you're not realizing that you are wretched. A word used for a desolated land. You are wretched. And you are pitiable. You deserve the pity of people because of your pitiful condition. You are poor. This is not the word that means you're just a little bit poor. This is a word that means you're wholly dependent on the grace of other people to even live. You're poor and you're blind. When you and I close our eyes because we have vision, what do we see? There is darkness, but we can also see certain colors, right? We can see certain forms of light, especially if a light is shining against us, we can feel that. So even as we close our eyes, even in our darkness, we can sense light, we can sense color. But if you talk to a person who has, who is blind, what they will tell you is, it's nothing but black. It's darkness. Jesus says that's who they are. They're blind. There's nothing but darkness. And that you are naked, a symbol of shame. But they're satisfied with their situation. So here's the call. We've got several things under the idea of this call. First of all, he offers them a word of counsel in verse 18. He says this, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. Now, remember, this was a banking center. They had a lot of gold. He said, you need to buy gold. He's not, not saying buy literal gold. What he's saying is, you need to come to me so that you might be rich in your faith. Then he uses the image of clothing. And you need white garments that you may clothe yourself that the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. Nakedness and shame go hand in hand in Scripture. It's as old as the garden and it comes all throughout Scripture. But the idea of being clothed is the idea of honor. Like Joseph or like Mordecai in Esther chapter 6. Joseph in Genesis 41 or the prodigal son in Luke 15. And, and on and on we could go. There's this symbolism going on. You're in a situation where you, expo you are exposed and you should be embarrassed, but you're not. And I'm saying, buy of, you, buy of me white garments. Cleanse your life so that you may stand pure before God. And then he uses the picture of medicine. And buy salve that you may anoint your eyes so that you may see. What is his point? He's using these metaphors, these images, to say what? You think you're rich, but you don't have me, so you have nothing. And you need to come to me that you might know what rich is. And that you might erase the shame that you have in the sight of God. So he tells them, repent. He says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Repent. It is not unloving. As a matter of fact, one of the most loving things we can do is to confront people with the truth and reality. That is not a license to beat people over the head. But there is the need to tell people the truth and to confront people with the truth, to discipline. Discipline is different than punishment. Punishment is simply for the cause of inflicting pain. Discipline is pain, inflicting pain with a purpose. You're trying to teach something in the process. That's why when we're 
raising our children, we're disciplining them. Because we're not just inflicting a punishment on them to inflict punishment on them. We're having to inflict punishment in order to teach them something. And if in the process of, of disciplining our children, we only punish them and we do not teach them, then all we have truly done is punish them, which is not what we're supposed to do. We have not disciplined them which is to explain the punishment and why it happened and why it's important for their development, to help them grow. And that's what Jesus is saying. I'm doing this to help you grow in your development. He says, if you will do that, he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Now, just as our American culture One of the ways that that we fellowship, one of the ways that we spend time together is what? We go out to eat, we sit around a table, we have people in our homes, we sit around a table. A meal implies, especially in Middle Eastern culture, implies openness and fellowship. And so Jesus is saying, I will come in. Now the word he uses here for dine, or some translations will say sup, or some will say eat, is actually a very particular word. It's describing, because the Jews had three meals a day, not in the sense that we have them, but they had their morning breakfast where they would take some dried bread and dip it in some wine and and eat it. Then they had their, if you can call it lunch, it was more like a snack. They would pull out of their pocket and eat in the fields most of the day. And then they had their big meal, which was at night when they got home. And that's where you put out the spread on the table, and that's where you had your friends in. It is that meal that Jesus is referencing here. I'm not saying I want, to, I want to grab a quick breakfast bar with you before you hit the door or share a little snack with you out in the field. I want to come into your home and I want to have fellowship and intimacy with you and I want to linger over fellowship together. And that's why in the end of this letter in Revelation chapter 19, we are invited into the marriage supper of the Lamb. The idea of communion and the table is all throughout the gospel, especially the gospel of Luke. There is this idea of communing with God at a table where we are breaking bread. That's what he offers them. Then he says, verse 21, To the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on on my throne as I conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. There's the idea, and to be honest with you, this phrase has such a high mentality to it, I'm not really sure. Well, I'm certain I don't know everything that's involved in it. There is a sense in which we reign with Christ, that we are seated with Christ in heaven. You see that in Ephesians chapter 2 when God raises us up and seats us together with Christ. There's a sense of reigning on the earth. Not in the sense of crushing people as a, as a, as a, as a despot or a monarch that, that crushes people underneath his feet, but the idea of enjoying an abundant life. That's what Christians are able to have. But there's also, even in the Revelation, chapter 22 and verse 5, after the church is in heaven at home with God forever at last, that we reign forever with him as well. Now, what all is involved in that, how all that works out, I'm not absolutely certain. But the overall image is, if you will overcome this, if you overcome your complacency, which is really what this is, you will sit with me on my throne. And you'll know what real victory looks like. Because to be victorious in business kind of pales in comparison to being victorious over the sinfulness of the world. And so he calls and finishes this letter with the call for us to consider the one who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And that's where the difficult task for us begins. I want to read to you a quote by a 20th century scholar. And I I say a 20th century scholar because when I read it, he's going to mention the 20th century. I realize we're in the 21st century, but it was in the 20th century when he wrote it, so that's why it's phrased this way. He says this about this letter to the Laodiceans. Perhaps none of the seven letters is more appropriate to the 20th century church, we would say 21st century, than this. It describes vividly the respectable, sentimental, Nominal, skin-deep religiosity, which is so widespread among us today. Our Christianity is flabby and anemic. 
we appear to have taken a lukewarm bath of religion. Why is it that all across America that there is such a gap between the filling of auditoriums between Sunday morning and Sunday night? Why is it that stats tell us that in America religious people are less likely to go to church when it is raining outside than they are when it is sunshiny. People say, we're in the middle of a pandemic. I get that. But this was a problem before pandemic ever hit. I want to share with you a profile of lukewarmness. This, I took, there's an individual who's written on this subject. I took the things that I thought were appropriate. Some of them I felt like he was repetitive. Some of them I don't think he was on base in his analysis. But I've taken some, added and subtracted and adapted a profile of a lukewarm individual. Number one. Lukewarm people attend church fairly regularly because it's the good Christian thing to do. It's not because it's where God is and it's the assembly of the firstborn from the dead. It's not because it's where God is and, all, and He is present with us and His angels are present with us and we are together before the majestic throne of God offering and pouring out ourselves in worship. That's not why we come. We come because it's Sunday morning and that's what we do. And we hang our hat on the fact that we went to church. But the, same, but the wise man said in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 10, I saw the wicked die and he was buried. And he used to come and go from the place of the holy. What does he mean? I saw the man buried in the city who used to come and go from the place of the holy. You would see him go to temple worship and come home. Go to temple worship and come home. Go to temple worship and come home. But what did he call him? I saw the wicked buried. Lukewarm people, it's so interesting, the deception of sin and the deception of Satan and the deception of lukewarmness is so vast. That there's the deception in the individuals who won't come to certain services and then there's the deception of the individuals who believe that just because they come to services, that makes them okay. The whole point that the Bible is trying to say about the corporate worship assembly, the whole point of it, is that the people of God redeemed would never ask this question. And I believe that one of the problems with modern day Christianity is we ask wrong questions. Some people want to push back and they, they, say, they call it legalistic. So <clears throat> they ask this question, do we have to attend every church service in order to go to heaven? Listen, there are layers of issues with that. Number one, the Bible... portrays worship and our coming together as not asking the question, why? How many can I miss? But the Bible would have us ask the question, when that question arises, why in the world would I want to miss? Do you see the difference? One is a minimalist attitude. Do I have to do it? I want, I, now look, I got to meet my requirements in order to get into heaven. The other one says, it's where God is. Why wouldn't I want to be there? Why would I miss the opportunity to be there? There's a fundamental difference in that. And there's an indicator of lukewarmness when we take those positions. Number two, lukewarm people do what is popular over what is right. 
to fit into whatever the mold. They're, they're afraid to go against the grain of what's going on in the particular moment. Number three, lukewarm people give money to the church and to charity or to the poor as long as it does not impinge upon their standard of living. That is, we'll give to the church. This is the way most individuals set out to handle their finances. First of all, a lot of Christians believe that God should be disconnected from their finances, which is amazing. Because the Lord spoke more about the proper use of finance than he did heaven and hell combined. But there are two philosophies to how we handle our finances. One, which is followed by a great deal of people, that is, we set our lifestyle. This is the house we're going to live in. These are the cars we're going to drive. This is what we're going to do. And then from what is left over, if we can afford it, then we'll give over to God. But if I understand what the Bible is saying correctly, it should probably go something more like this. This is what God has blessed me with. This belongs to God. Now I'm going to build my life based around what I have left. You see the difference in priorities there? Number four, lukewarm people really don't want to be saved, really don't want, or excuse me, really want to be saved from their sin. They want to be saved from the penalty of their sin. That is, in essence, they want to go to heaven because it's better than the alternative. It's not because heaven is where God is and is a God who overwhelmed them with a crazy amount of love and redeemed them and loved them out of their sin. They just simply don't want to go to hell. Lukewarm people say they love Jesus and He is indeed a part of their lives, but the only a part. They give Him a section of their time, their money, their thoughts, but He isn't really allowed to control their lives. In Luke 9, 59 to 62, there are three interactions Jesus has with three different individuals about following Him. And the basic thrust of them comes down to this. The point is to follow Jesus whenever, wherever, whatever. That's the point. You see, we struggle with the idea of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Because when you submit to... It's, it's often been said, and I think rightly so, a lot of people love Jesus as Savior because He's liberating them. But they don't like the idea of Lord. They don't like the idea of someone coming into their lives and telling them how to live but you cannot have one without the other. How many times in the Bible is Jesus described as our Lord and Savior? You can't divorce them. Lukewarm people probably drink and swear less than the average, but besides that, they're really no different than your typical unbeliever. Isn't it amazing that, we, that sometimes we can reduce Christianity? You know, I don't really swear very much, and I, I, I don't get drunk. And that's the basis for our Christianity? Lukewarm people love good preaching and teaching, but it's nothing more than a form of entertainment for them. The passage we read this morning in Ezekiel chapter 30. You're like one who plays a pleasant instrument. They appreciate a good presentation. The same way they appreciate a good lecture or they appreciate a good song put on by a musician or they appreciate watching an athlete excel in his sport. Preaching is nothing more than an art to them. It's not actually something where they hear the voice of God and seek to be transformed. Finally, lukewarm people resent anyone who challenges the status quo of the church or their individual lives. They resent anyone in any respect who challenges the status quo of the church or their individual life. See Jesus and the scribes and Pharisees. You're not going to tell me I'm wrong. I do this, 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 and this. You're not going to point out what's wrong here. You're just being a troublemaker now. You're, just, you're getting to nitpicking. You've gone to meddling. And the reason why that's lukewarmness 
is because mature Christians understand there is always room for improvement and they welcome any opportunity to improve. But lukewarm people are comfortable where they are and they don't like the idea of anyone pointing out any flaw in their thinking, in their behavior, or anything else. So on the church level, let's ask this question and then we'll be done. When you look at Acts chapter 2, which is a chapter that's very important to us in the church as restorationists, okay, seeking to restore Christianity to its original practice. In Acts 2 and verse 47, there's a phrase that's often overlooked. When the Bible says about the church, praising God, that is they were worshiping God and having favor with all of the people. What does that mean? Having favor with all of the people. The only thing I can figure is there was some type of community interaction between the church and the community. And so one of the hard questions we have to ask about churches is this. If we cease to exist as a church today, would our community notice one or two? Would they be worse off? When people hear about the church, what do they say? Do they even know it exists? Or have churches become complacent in the fact that they open their doors and invite people in? That was the Old Testament way. Many people have rightly contrasted the Old Testament form versus the New Testament form. In the Old Testament, you had the temple and you invited people to come and encounter God in the temple. It was called a come and see religion, whereas the gospel has been called a go and tell religion. Don't come and see the temple. We're not inviting you to come and see the temple. We're going and we're telling you about the one who is greater than the temple, Jesus Christ. Here's the problem with Laodicea and with every church that would fit its its designation. One writer simply put it this way. The church at Laodicea had everything except for Christ. But isn't it amazing they thought they had him? Laodicea, if you had told them, you need to go to the doctor because you've got a problem they would have yelled at the top of their lungs, I don't need a doctor. And they did not know they had one foot in the grave and the other was ready to follow. Maybe that's us tonight as an individual, our lukewarmness. We need to rekindle those fires and we need to lock ourselves in and re-engage. We need to repent before the Lord, whether that's in a public or private way. Or maybe someone who is outside of Christ, to come to the Lord Jesus Christ in penitent faith, confessing Him in order to be immersed in water for, our, for the forgiveness of your sins. We become a part of the church. And then we have a great responsibility before us. If we can help you tonight, it's what we want to do as we stand and sing the song. <clears throat>
trust always in his love. Kneel at the cross. Leave every care. Kneel at the cross. Jesus. 